Hey sinners, it's Adam Knox. Welcome to another episode of The Cult of You and welcome to an episode that is an interview segment. And today's session, I get to talk to an incredible man, someone who has walked this path for over 25 years and who is in and of himself written over 15 books already that is out in the market and has another five due for release later and during the course of the next year. I'm speaking about no one other than the incredible Arundel Overman. Arundel has a very unique approach to occultism and magic. Someone who has practiced traditional Salamic magic initially and then moved and progressed into certain more left hand past based traditions. He is also the creator of the Al Ghul system of magic. Arundel has a very unique approach and we discuss today quite in detail some of these things. Not only his journey in the occult and his relationship and experience with Asmodeus, but also the entire process of his magic, some of his methods that have achieved success for himself so that you can learn how to apply those methods for yourself. We also discuss a little bit about that debate about whether to use traditional Salamic approaches versus purely left-hand path approaches and the consequences and the effects. Today is a very powerful discussion that you do not want to miss. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this amazing interview. And remember to live deliciously. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here on The Cult of You. Thank you, sir, for taking the time to chat to us today. For those of you that are not familiar, we have a genius mind here with an absolute dedication to this craft and the development of the community, author of over 15 books already, and now with five more under the belt that's on the way out. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute honor. It's a pleasure and a gift. I have so many different interesting questions from subscribers to the show that are also, I believe, long-term fans of yours. But before we kind of get into those questions, I'd like to open our conversation with, if you, with a little bit of a kind of a journey. You know, what is it that has kind of led you on this path? I mean, a lot of practitioners and people that we spoke to or that have spoken to and that I've met in my life, some have come across it by accident. Some have come across it by, you know, the curse of God, so to speak, as in there's some of us that just cannot be pulled away from this path. Uh, some has been a ritual experience, a mystical experience. What has been your journey that's really led you to a place where you are now, where it's not just an intellectual fascination. It is a true way of life and is a fundamental way of thinking. What was some of the core path or points that led you onto that? Um, well, I'd say there was about three different turning points. The first turning point was there was a man who came to my parents' church, and he said that what we perceive of as solid physical reality is actually spiritual mass that's in a very slow vibration. And at that point, I kind of grasped that the spiritual world and the physical world are the same thing, but existing in different rates of vibration. So it's kind of like a light bulb went off in my head and I wanted to know more about what was called the new age movement. Um, and then I went on a trip with that guy and we started doing some silence of the mind meditation where you just clear your mind. It was real simple. And when I got back, um, I was sitting on the couch or laying on the couch and I just had a spontaneous out of body experience. I found myself floating up above my body and uh, everything was made out of light and I could see millions of individual particles look like everything was glowing. And I passed through a wall and I was floating under a light bulb. And uh, so that kind of showed me that the astral projection world was real. And then the next big turning point in my life was I met the spirit Asmo Day. And to kind of give you a little bit about that, um, I had stumbled across a book called Modern Magic. You may have heard of it, Donald Michael Craig. And uh, um, it had 
a couple of spirits in there, you know, the sigils from the Goetia. And it mentioned that there was this book called the Goetia. And so I ordered the Goetia and it came to my um, house where I was living with my girlfriend and she brought it down to where I was at work at the time. And I opened it and I looked at it and I saw, you know, I had some strange diagrams in it, but couldn't really tell much about it because I was on break. So a couple of days later, she was gone from the house and I was all alone. And my plan was to study some magic for the day. And I went in this room that was my temple area and it was a completely bare room and a copy of the Galicia was laying on the floor. And um, I kind of, my mind kind of wandered, you know, and I, I went over this a million times in my head, trying to analyze it from every different angle, what happened next but I saw a cloud of red energy coming out of the book, kind of like a teardrop shape, you know, like you might, you might imagine a genie coming out of a lamb. It was really like that. And it was red and it was glistening and it was sparkling. And I looked at it and I was just like, wow, what is that? You know, and I could see that it went down to the book and it just kind of came up like a cloud coming out of that book. And uh, I looked at it for some time, maybe perhaps a minute of time. And then I heard an audible voice and it said, it said, stand back in the room and I will manifest before you. And so I knew that something was about to happen, but I didn't know what. So I kind of took a step back in the room and the cloud just kind of opened up, like, you know, exploded outwards like that. And there he was. And he had three heads. One was a man, one was a ram, and one was a bull. And down below him was a dragon about the size of an alligator. And, um, the man head had hair just sticking out like crazy all over everywhere. And his face was real, was kind of thinner than mine. And it was real intense. And he was looking right at me. And this was not like, like, it wasn't like a shadow or, you know, a ghost. It was perfectly clear. You could, I could see the individual teeth in his mouth and the individual strands of hair. And the bull head was to the side of him. It just seemed to stare off out in the space. And the ram head was looking out this way. And uh, I was looking at this thing. And I was just like, what in the world am I seeing? I had no idea. But I'd never heard of asthma day in my life. I had no idea that there could be such a thing as a three-headed creature that rode on dragon, you know. And he says, pick up the book. And... Um, so I, you know, kind of knelt down, but I didn't take my eyes off of him because I, I was afraid I'd lose what I was seeing. It was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen in my life. I wasn't really scared, but I kind of have described it like looking at the Grand Canyon or something of that awe-inspiring, you know. Mm. And uh, so I, I, I was holding the book and he said, open the book. And he's just looking at me and his face is, you know, it's, he's moving. It's, it's not like a still image or anything like that and so I opened the book and I'm just probably my mouth was probably hanging open drool running out and he says look down so I look down and there it says the 32nd spirit is asthma day and he's got this form he's got three heads one's a man one's a ram one's a, a, a bull and he's he rideth on an infernal dragon you know it's got that medieval talk and so in that moment I knew that what I was looking at there in front of me was a spirit out of that book and that I was, he'd caused me to open the book somehow right to the page that he was on. He's the only spirit that has that exact form, those three specific heads and rides on that dragon. Hmm. And um, but all this time has probably at least a minute or two has passed while I'm just standing there looking at him. And it was a very long experience. It wasn't like, you know, 10 seconds or just a flash. What am I seeing? There it is. And it's gone, you know? And so I said to him, I said, what are you, you know, or just who are you? How, how can you exist? I don't remember my exact words. And then the next thing that happened, I've tried to remember it a million times and I don't know exactly what happened next. My girlfriend at the time has told me that she came home and I was still seeing him. And I was like, he's right there. Do you see him? You know, I was still talking to him. Um, <clears throat> but I personally don't remember him leaving. Um, so I, I really couldn't tell you exactly how he left or how the experience ended. Um, but that was how I met Asmo Day. And it just completely split my life in half, you know. And this was a completely and, spontaneous experience. You you weren't 
practicing evocational magic of the Goetia at that point. You pretty much entered this, ordered the book, and the spontaneous manifestation started. The relationship began like that. Yeah, absolutely. I had no idea of Asmodee. Uh, now, I think I may have tried the ritual out of modern magic for how to evoke Baal, you know, but it totally wasn't Goetia related. It was more like a LBRP, BRH type mm -hmm. deal, you know, and, and a paper sigil around my neck. And I may have tried one evocation, but I had not uh, read the Goetia itself because I just got it in the mail and it was my day off and I was going to look through it that day, you know, but yeah, I had no idea. There was no <clears throat> psychological primer. There was no pre-psychology of what it should look like, what it should be. So this wasn't really like a self-hypnosis thing at all. This was a complete spontaneous manifestation and contact with the entity. Is that then how the relation, I'm kind of like jumping into the question because you did say that there's three, but um, is that how the relationship it began? Was it completely one guided through Asmodee? Uh, yeah, somehow he opened my third eye. You know, I'm not sure exactly how he did it, um, but that was my first meeting with him and I had absolutely no, I had no idea of who he was or his form. I'd never heard about him, never read about him. And he just came out of the book like a genie out of the lamp and appeared to me right there. And, and you know, that's how it went down. And so after that, I started reading the Goetia, started building all the tools and just, I mean, there were times when I worked from four to eight hours a day on magic for years of my life. Mm. Um, because of seeing him, it was so incredible that it just pushed me to read and study in ways that I think most people wouldn't. Mm, naturally, with that, <clears throat> spontane, that, that profound experience, I think that's a, it's a very definite form of evidence of contact that's outside of normal kind of psychological processes. But leading up to that, you, you mentioned that you did the stillness work and the meditative work, which led to a out of body or astral state experience. Were you before that practicing any other things like Taoist yoga, Tantra, things like that to really enhance the energetic body? Or did this really only kind of develop after that? Because I do understand that in the Al Ghul Componium, there's, there's a lot of tantric and, and yogic techniques and breathing techniques that you do teach in those systems. Um, was this something that came after the contact of Asmode? Or is this, was there already some of this in place beforehand? Um, the only magic that I had done before I met him was uh, out of modern magic, basically Golden Dawn based, <clears throat> lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, banishing ritual of the hexagram, middle pillar, um, and silence of the mind meditation, maybe a little bit of stretches. I, I was only 21 at the time. No, I, I think I was only 19 at the time. So I really hadn't even done any major yoga or anything like that. Probably read four books on magic, like um, Beginner's Wicca, you know, stuff like that. I remember. <clears throat> but that was it, really. Yeah. Just didn't know much, you know. This, this was a period of time, and I think, um, you know, God rest um, Michael Soul. Uh, he was he was an entry point, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, modern magic was such a digestible piece of material, even modern sex magic, and I believe his final book, Modern Tantra. Um, very well researched, very well read, um, you know, for the time period. And I think it opened up for a lot of magicians, and a lot of people you know, forget that we do owe the man quite a bit of credit for his efforts, you know, in the industry. Right. So I, I feel the same. I also had some of my earliest experiences and journeys in that and used to teach those techniques for years uh, because they did have foundations. But you, I think the magician that practices, you break past those frameworks and you move into a different sphere when that direct relationship starts to, to come about. And that should ultimately be the goal that the, I think the, the systems become useful crutches. They should never become crutches. They should never kind of stay in that. But there's a lot more that I want to speak to you about that. And I think we'll get into that. There's, there's this classic three tiers of initiation, the, the outer guide, the inner transmutation, and the final contact with the main guide. Then did Asmodee, how did that relationship develop? Were you, did, it, did he come and visit you? Did he initiate the rest of the work? Or did you initiate the rest of the work through the practices inside of the Goetia at the time? Because this was classic Salomic approaches at that period, as I understand it, right? At that time, that was before the internet. You got to realize that was like 26 years ago. Yeah. And so all I had was the Goetia 
And I didn't know a single other person on the planet who knew about the Goetia or anything like that. So I spent the next 20 years working magic from a more traditional perspective. Like uh, I went through all the grades of the Golden Dawn, built a vault of the Adepti. Um, and then of course I built all the equipment from the Goetia in its traditional form. Like, and I, I was uh, using the names of God and the angels and the hazel wand and the metal seals, you know, and all that type of stuff to bind the spirits. Wow. And then about five years ago, um, I started writing Libra Asmodeus, and it was a different book at the time, which was just kind of be a compendium of different magic that I'd learned. And then one day I was just there at the house and I heard the words, um, <clears throat> thus saith the demon Asmodeus, which is the first words of the book. I wrote that down and then he just started going from there and sometimes he will appear to me and sometimes I've evoked him um, the longest that I saw him um, since the original encounter which the original encounter I would say had to be at least two three five minutes long it was a very long experience you know where you're seeing him on that level where you can see the individual teeth in his mouth and the hairs on his head, you know? And I think that seeing a spirit on that level is very difficult for the human consciousness to uh, maintain for a very long period of time. And the longest that I'd seen him was uh, after that was <clears throat> probably 15 years later, uh, me and a friend were working in the traditional uh, Goetia setup and we had prepared for it very extensively. We had all of the tools. I had been celibate for some time. I believe it was five days. I had also fasted 24 hours prior to the evocation. And we were doing at least three to four full hour long evocations in the traditional equipment uh, a week. So we were working very hard, had a tremendous amount of power built up. And then there was a time where I probably saw him for, I would estimate like, up to 14 seconds solid, you know, it's like in that clear. Um, <clears throat> but it's very difficult to, to get that kind of contact where you can see one that clearly and then also to maintain it. Usually what I found was like, if we were doing really heavy evocation, you'd be conjuring and you'd see something like a shadow there or a shape and then a part of it might come into physical view and you're, oh my God, there it is, it's a warrior on a griffin. And then you can only get like two or three seconds before it fades. And then you might be able to hear auditory sensations or receive telepathic communication after that. But holding that crystal clear, you can see down the hairs of its head for a very long period. Like as when I mean long, I mean like five to 10 seconds is very difficult. You see what I'm saying? Um, and, and it depends on, <clears throat> it depends on your preparation, how, uh, pure your body is and your mind is and what kind of control you have over your addictions, how celibate you are. Um, I have found that, I mean, to put it bluntly, especially for men, how much semen you have in your body is how clearly you're going to be able to see spirits. And also fasting is another key. There's a reason why, there's a reason why all those old books hammer the same keys. And those in, in, in your grand grimoire, your Croatia, uh, grimoire of Pope Honorius, all of the old grimoires, bar none, come down to these points. You're going to have to pray and confess your sins, which we might look at as meditation, and you're going to have to go celibate, and you're going to have to control your diet or fast in one way or the other, you know, and the different books have different regimens, like uh, the Grand Grimoire has a period of seven days where you're only supposed to eat twice a day, and uh, that's supposed to be 12 hours apart. And that's to clear out your stomach and, and, you know, prepare you for the evocation. So if you want to see them on that level to where you're like, oh, my God, you've got to use those keys. And I, I preach those all the time, whether you're right hand path or left hand path, because it's, it's a fun to go ahead. It's, it's one of those core ideas, again, in magic that, that's oftentimes overlooked. You get a lot of the younger practitioners that's almost, they look at the spell books or they look at the grimoires like if they're just these little, you know, quick fix recipes. I can just say these things in this sequence and I'm going to have success. Um, forgetting that there is a completely different component of it. There's a classic development of the will and the imagination. Uh, in a recent discussion that I had with Enoch Petrocello that went through his journey with mental health. And one of the key concepts he also spoke about was um, the development of the will, giving up 
sex, for example, for a period of time, giving up food, and this training of the will both trains the mind. But again, as you point out very clearly there, the extra semen in the body is this almost this alchemical substance of manifestation. And either we're, we're wasting it, we're leaking it, or we're alchemically transmuting it by purifying that energy. And that increases the psychic force that is again available. Um, I think that is some of the more core ideas. I remember when early parts of my journey, my first encounter was with Beelzebub. And the manifestation was intense and then almost gone for years afterwards with no direct contact. Um, and only after my progression through a number of stages, he returned to me in ceremony. And I realized that he's always, he was always there. In the background, they almost guided a lot of the progression, things that I wasn't ready for. But I almost had to psychically prepare myself, both mentally and energetically in my body, learning to overcome my addictions learning to overcome my weaknesses so that I would have a greater reservoir of energy available in order to act as a manifestation base to help that facilitation inside of the process. You raise a, a very interesting point. Um, there's a big debate in the, in the left-hand path communities about the Salomic kind of approach to the Goethic spirits. Some are completely anti the binding, the use of the angels. There's the stories about if you do use it, they're going to punish you kind of a thing. Um, you've successfully used those, practice, those practices initially from not really a right hand, but what many would call a right hand approach, um, which is that traditional abramatic kind of approach. And only recently, you said in the last five years, moved into a more left hand direct kind of access. How... How would you describe that? Is it really a case of you should not use the Islamic methods? They have negative results. Is the direct contact better? What is your current mindset around approaching specifically the, the spirits of the Goetia and working with them to a point of manifestation? Well, that's kind of a tricky question. And it can be looked at on a couple of different levels. Um, the Goetia itself doesn't really involve Christianity. Obviously, the book is pretending at least to be from Solomon. So you won't find any men mentions of Jesus or anything like that in the Galicia. Um, some of your other grimoires do, like, you know, the Grand Grimoire or whatever. They have elements of Christianity in them. But at least for me, which was coming through, through the Galicia, there wasn't any Christianity, but there was at least Yahweh and the angels and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I, how can I put this? My perspective on it at that point was just that when I first came into it, I believed that Solomon wrote the book, you know, whereas now I know that that's not true. And I, it was just so awe inspiring, you know. Um, I think that it boils down to your heart and that the spirits will know your intentions. And if you call them through a Solomonic method, but you're respectful to them, the, the book has some clues in it that it will say things like, you know, after you invoke this great king and you bind it by this and this, you must treat it with great respect and offer it incense and stuff like that. So there, it, it does kind of have a mixed um, perspective on it that you are treating these beings with great respect. And I think that eventually a goetic worker will come to the point where they will realize that nobody likes to do something for nothing. So even if you are invoking them with the names of angels or Yahweh, you're going to have to make offerings to them. And the book does mention that. I mean, if you look at Belial, it says you need to make an offering to Belial and treat him as a great king. Um, and there's several others. So I think that if someone came through it uh, with the Solomonic approach, they would be okay if they truly had a heart for the spirits. Now, I think if you look at yourself as in that you are mighty and exalted above these beings and you're going to go to ordering them around sooner or later you may end up having some problems with that personally i always loved asmodee from the moment i saw him i was just like wow this is the coolest thing i could possibly ever imagine and so uh my heart was always with the spirits you know that, that's about the only thing that i could say for it um in, in modern times, I think, you know, in, in the past five years, I've left Christianity in the sense that I can't, I just don't feel that it's right for me to connect to it. You know, I mean, I just don't feel um, 
connected to Christianity. It, it has some superiority issues. It looks down on other religions. It thinks that it's the best, and, and it thinks that all pagan gods are demons, whereas for myself, I mean, the pagan gods, those are my friends, you know? Mm. So that's, I imagine you probably see it in a similar perspective. I see Kali there behind you. <clears throat> yes, yes. I, I, I think it's a perspective that, I, that, that we deeply do share. I also find that, again, the framework is, is very much related to the, the perspective and the emotional and psychological development of the, of the witch, so to speak. Uh, how do we relate to those journeys? At a time period, I found that excessive ritual and ceremony was a serious requirement. And I think in the beginning, uh, it is a necessary step. It helps the development of the psyche. It helps developing the ceremonies until a stronger relationship is established. And then once that initial relationship is established, a different attunement kind of comes into, uh, which I guess is very much the same as somebody who was born with a bloodline that's connected to gin magic versus somebody that comes from a completely foreign place and now needs to adopt that. They, they may need to adopt some kind of framework at first. And then again, the attitude and the relationship is dynamic. But this is, I think, where a lot of practitioners confuse a lot of the psychology. A lot of people seem to say, when we say there's this we're all one and spirits one thing we're often saying that that's true at a quantum fundamental level of reality we're not saying that's true at a personality level you know just because we may be connected and made from the same fundamental substances as the universe that doesn't mean we're the same thing you know it's the same way when somebody takes a massive dose of psilocybin mushrooms you're very quickly going to realize that even though that thing is in your body you don't have control over it initially uh, until you've kind of developed that work through that poison. So systematic exposure to the force, but also reverence and respect to this force. You are unlocking and you are opening a door. And I don't necessarily think it may be wise for a beginner, especially someone that hasn't done the work. They haven't done some of the groundwork. They haven't looked at their psychology. They haven't overcome some of their addictions to imagine themselves being successful, you know, in the practice immediately. That false narratives, those mixed religious narratives that are still in the brain may be the biggest thing that's sabotaging their magic and their result sets inside of that. You have, you've cultivated over the years quite a bit of a more sophisticated system in some of your practice, things that are taught in the Al Ghul method um, that involve a lot of energetic work, psychological work, um, and as well as practice. How would you say has your own personal practice uh, kind of evolved since that more organized mm -hmm. Salomic period, more ceremo traditional ceremonial magic period into today in your current, more left hand like approach and relationship to the spirits. What does that look like for you at the moment? Um, well, I still do like using the circle and triangle from the Goetia, but I don't use the angels or the names of God. I, I'm, I'm going to have a tendency to rely on the, bornless ritual. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I invoke the bornless one, the I invoke blah, blah, blah. Um, but I see that as what we might call Baphomet, which is just the universe, the all. It's, it's plugging into that electrical power. Uh, the bornless one is definitely not Yahweh. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a wand and a, and a circle and a triangle and a set of conjurations and something to offer the spirit is my prim primary tools. Um, but I also find that um, stretching the body through yoga and Toltec body movements and breath control um, greatly increases it. And, and if you're going to go into heavy vocation, you want to have three days celibate and the final day fast. That's what I do when I'm really getting serious. Um, <clears throat> do you think that is mostly, there's, there's a couple of reasons why I think, because I, I also believe in the power of fasting. Um, the power of transmutation of sexual energy, the avoidance of orgasm. Um, I will sometimes refer to the utilization of sexual energy without orgasm, but then simply taking the, or the sexual energy and using, for example, the Taoist yogic system um, or some tantric systems in order to transmute that energy so that it's cultivated, but it's never released and it's purified um, to a point and then going through a complete celibate period with that. So I've got the base primed along with the eating technique. Do you think it is predominantly a chemical based thing that's happening inside mm -hmm. of the body? I mean, there's a lot of philosophies in, in the Vama Magra traditions 
and there's tantric kind of views that the kalas kind of get stimulated as a result of this energetic transmutation which has an effect on the biochemistry we know there is biochemical changes in the body from the cleaning out of the stomach to the releasing of growth hormone um, which are benefits again of fasting extensive fasting are these the dominant factors that lead to the success and the alteration of consciousness in your thoughts or experience or is it more the act of will of overcoming the natural slavery you know that the system has to these things um both of the things that you mentioned i think that it, it is uh denying your your wants has a tendency to increase your willpower and then of course you do have biological you know chemical release and things like that i mean when you're <clears throat> when your blood is involved in digestion it can't flow to the brain as well so your thoughts aren't going to focus as clearly and all that but there's also the um the magical component of it the energetic component the, the rays of your astral body are strengthened hmm. and then that's where the real power comes in when it comes to evoking now you you've done a massive uh, stretch of research over the years from uh, traditional Western Eastern traditions, um, looking at systems like the Golden Dawn, practicing throughout the systems in the classic days, all the way into the the darker aspects of the path. Um, so inside of this kind of global framework uh, of experiences, do you have a specific uh, belief or correspondence that you found with the Goetia? and the spirits of the Goetia in relationship to, for example, the tree of life, the runes, systems like that, or yogic systems or astrological systems. How do you personally map them? Are they an independent completely, or do they serve a direct relationship to any of these systems? Um, well, I'm not really crazy about the tree of life myself. I mean, I learned the Tree of Life so well in the Golden Dawn, it was outrageous. They got a million different correspondences. And at one point I could tell you, I probably still could tell you a name of God, a name of an angel, a choir of angels, a color, uh, a tarot card with every single path, all the Hebrew letters. I mean, it just went on and on and on and on and on. And um, personally, I'm just, I don't, I don't use the Tree of Life in my current magic. I would be much more inclined to deal with the chakra system because I just feel like it's more pagan and, you know, I don't know how to use that. I don't really align the Goetia to the Zodiac. They are planetarily aligned in the Goetia. You know, they've got dukes and kings and stuff like that, and they align up to the seven planets. But I don't think that the 72 in the Goetia is any particular number or that it really truly does, uh, you know, line up to the zodiacal ring as they as they talk. I, I think that it was, from my research, it was based off of um, uh, the Heptameron, which is an early grimoire, and it was based off of a book called uh, The Discovery of Witchcraft, which had a demon list in it that was drawn from the demonologist uh, Wyrus. Um, but we, we think that the Goetia itself was Discovery of Witchcraft rather than the demonologist Wyrus because uh, the demonologist Wyrus had the spirit Proof Loss or Proof Loss in his list. And that one was dropped from the discovery of witchcraft. And it was also dropped from the Goetia. Um, and that's why historians feel like that it was composed from the discovery of witchcraft rather than the actual works of Wyrus. So there was 69 spirits and then they added a couple to bring it up to 72. Why they did that, I think it was probably just a good number to round off to. Um, but once again, I, I don't particularly think the Goetia spirits are uh, aligned with the Holy Shimham Frosh angels. And I, I think that's just something that people did later on, you know. And um, yeah, I just, I, I think that they're just a, a random bunch of spirits. And, and they're from all sorts of different places. I mean, you've got... Asmodei, who comes from um, the ancient Persian, he was Ashmadeva, the demon of wrath in Zoroastrianism. And then you've got spirits like Nibirius, who was the three-headed dog Cerbere, if I'm saying that right, pronounce that right, Kerberos, uh, in the Greek mythology. It's a three-headed dog from, you know, the underworld. So you've got spirits, and then you've got 
Astaroth, or which was Astarte, which was from the Canaanite pantheon. And then you've got just a whole mix match of spirits from all over the place, you know. And those spirits are in thousands of different grimoires. A lot of people don't realize how many grimoires there are. Um, but lately, I've, especially, I've been going through these manuscript scans in the various libraries and stuff. And man, it's just, it's amazing. There's hundreds of Faust works just on Legend of Faust itself. Wow. So yeah, there's there's thousands of grimoires. I think and the Galicia spirits are in them. So I think this is like mm -hmm. one of the key things that's, that that's being opened up, and it's something people are only looking at now because let's face it, historically a lot of people would look at, especially practitioners that are coming into the craft, they get the short, little, quick description that's in the old classic interpretations, and that's it. And they kind of use that small little. It's like a power animal trip in a video game, you know. X looks like Y and can do this and the other. And this is how many practitioners approach that, um, or especially beginner practitioners. And it's not an adequate thing because I don't think a relationship is really being established and they're missing all the qualities of the relationship that get, kind of gets cultivated. When we take on the attitude of recognizing that most, most of these were ancient gods or they were you know, very strong powers or very strong forces with very rich hierarchies and histories behind them. I mean, there's all texts that connect them to, to star positions, but then there's complete myths and history behind them. And we talk about Astaroth, which again was a star day in the beginning, and a practitioner that doesn't do the historical work, doesn't do their own risk, I think is missing out on a lot of really rich history. In fact, each of them almost opening up their own path or their own set of possibilities and traditions to learn from and grow from and discover as a system. And I like this notion that says that in a way, if somebody utilizes the Shema Mephras, I've seen uh, uh, systems even in the Dragon Rouge where, <clears throat> because again, the runes, it was a trinity, it was a, a, a triple system. So the runes, the Uthrak runes being combined uh, by three gives you 72 and there's links mapping those together. These are, these are useful systems for a person's own paradigm and own personal organization as a mnemonic, you know, as a memory system or a personal organization system. But I think using them as doctrine is where it becomes dangerous and almost where we where we limit ourselves, you know, we, we stop ourselves from really opening up to the possibility of what the spirit is going to bring us and what new research can bring us because we're so committed, you know, to a certain way of what it should be. Um, when right. there's not really that much publication material, you know, that's inside of the piece. You know, and I remember recently uh, you, you're starting work <laughs> on one of your next pieces around uh, circles and power circles. Um, I believe that you did some posts about recently and you were commenting about some of the research that you brought up with the look of the classic interpretations of Faust and the work and, and the book of Faust and the story of Faust. And I know there's, there's varied points of view as well around the same text, but people take the front one, the one that's the most published. Um, and they don't necessarily consider the interpretations, the original pieces where that kind of gets its root from. Um, and instead they just kind of look at it. Now, one of the kind of paradigms, that I see very systematic of this in the occult world today is there's books out there come up being published today that says you don't need any of the rituals. You don't need the sigils. You just need this path working. And then there's others that says, no, 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 you don't, you don't need the path working. You just need the end. Um, I believe I, uh, there was a comment on a forum that <laughs> I, you, you gave feedback on as well and pointed out so very rightly that outside of Connolly's work, there's very limited reference, you know, if any, about the roots of the end. Is that correct? There isn't any at all. Uh, the ends originate from her. And I mean, I'm not saying that to be negative towards her. I have respect for her as a magician. And I personally like the ends and I've had some good experiences with them. But I'm not going to try to pull your leg and say that they're ancient. Mm. And I think that's a, that's a key kind of idea here. So what based upon your research, based on your discovery um, and your work currently where it is today, how would you recommend someone go about doing that relationship building with these spirits? Let's just say they don't have the benefit as, as some of us have had that have had direct contact or a direct relationship or the many years of practice or experience. They're fairly fresh to the craft. 
They've maybe, maybe come from a personal development background. In other words, they've done some work on themselves. They're starting to recognize, oh, I need to also take responsibility for my own energy system, cultivate my will, cultivate my imagination, look at getting the base stuff down. They want to enter this practice. They want to establish a relationship. Where should someone like that start? Um, are there any of your own materials that you would recommend maybe as a bit of a syllabus? Um, and if they maybe don't have access to that, what are things that they should keep in mind when doing this approach to both guard themselves from danger as well as kind of lead them on the right path and not like down an endless rabbit hole of false ideas that don't necessarily give results? Uh, well, first of all, you need to get the grimoires themselves and read them as a base of knowledge instead of starting from someone that's a modern author. You know, and then if you want to look at modern authors after that, that's cool. But I hear people that say, how can I evoke Baal? And they had never even read the Goetia, <laughs> which just kind of makes me laugh. First of all, get the book itself and read it at least 10 times if you want to be serious and you want to think that you're going to <clears throat> evoke one of these spirits, sit down and read the book 10 times. I mean, I've read it 100 times, so you know, reading it 10 times is nothing. Um, and then after that, you probably want to make a decision as to whether you want to work it traditionally. And if you work it traditionally, you're going to have an incredible experience. And I, I personally won't uh, discourage someone from working it traditionally just because that's the, the most powerful way other than the Al Ghul way that I know. And, and I would recommend either of those ways. And they'll both lead you to the same experience in the end which is a direct face-to-face -face experience with the spirit. Um, but they kind of do so by different methods. Uh, the traditional method is very involved in putting power into the various tools, such as your hazel wand and your elaborate circle. And, you know, incense is very difficult to make. You've got to get lignum aloes, which are very hard to get. You've got to go a month celibate to be able to make the brass vessel. I mean, if you carry off the instructions in the original Goetia, you will have tremendous experiences. And, and that's what I'm all about is getting to that point where you can have a face-to-face -face like you and I are having with the spirit, because that is possible. And most people, you know, they do the path work and say, they're never really going to get that real experience. You know what I'm saying? And the, the Al Ghul system is very stripped down in tools by comparison, but it has those other keys of breath control and body movements and things like that that will eventually lead you to that face-to-face, -face, oh my fucking God, there it is, experience. And that's what you really want. I mean, I would think anyway, you know, that's what you want to get to. Hmm. There's, a, there's a practice in, if we look at traditional spiritualism, where we do the classic mirror gazing technique. <clears throat> and the practitioner begins to look at the mirror for a period of time, extend it into his, uh, with the, you know, hakula, what the hunas referred to as, as hakula. And we start seeing the, the spirits or the faces. And there's this classic, you know, correlation between the psychic and psychological development of the practitioner and some of the spirits that are coming through spontaneously inside of this. It's the old classic, I'm the exorcist in the midst of the exorcism. If I change, the spirits that naturally attract themselves to me also change. Do you find that there is a correlation at a similar level with goethic working? In other words, the more attributes that I match of the entity, um, is that going to help me come into rapport with the entity as I work with the entity in a path working like process is cultivating those components <clears throat> of self necessary as part of a personal evolution. Cause there's, there's almost like a, you know, the low magic, high magic approach, right? The one of working the magic purely for the result and the other one working the magic purely for the evolution so that I almost become the result as it, as it is would you advise one or the other? Do you see that there is a relationship in your own psychology versus who and what you're actually able to connect with magically? Um, or, or is that purely a basis of the technique? Well, psychology is important and I think it's very useful and all that, but I definitely don't think that <clears throat> the spirits are, as Crowley said, parts of the human brain or anything like that you know he was messing around with that essay and people just took it and ran with it if you read his later works he definitely says uh these are 
consciousness is outside of our, our brain. My opinion is that the spirits are not uh, reliant on us at all. If I never would have been born, Asimo Day would still be roaming around the universe doing his thing. And the spirits are uh, completely, you know, independent of my brain. That's that's how I feel about it. Okay. Um, so we're kind of slowly <clears throat> starting to run out of time. And there's a few more questions, if you don't mind, that I just want to sneak in while I still have you on here with me. Um, is that okay? Go for it. Okay, so firstly, you've got, you've got some work in terms of relationship with the werewolf. Um, and I believe you're going to be heading towards a little bit of a project in relationship to, to the werewolf magic. Now, there's, there's a couple of pieces or books that are out there on this at the moment, and there's mixed views on lithography, forgive my pronunciation, um, and the entire practice of well, werewolf magic. Could you give us your view on that subject matter as a whole and your approach to it? Oh, well, that's a big subject. Um, <clears throat> let, let me just say for starters that I haven't transformed into a hairy beast and roamed the countryside eating farmers' chickens, you know, and uh, I have not, not done that. But I don't know, I, I do think that that is possible with a certain level of energy raised. And I have had experiences where it felt like to me that I had was growing hair all over my body. and and the sensation seemed physical, although I know that it, or at least I think that it was not physical, um, but <clears throat> I don't know how, how it would be hard to sort of bring the whole lore of the werewolf together. You know, it's a lot of different things. Uh, you can find references on, on the werewolf going back as far as a thousand years and quotes on them um, with people believing it as a superstition and the church uh, condemning it, saying, you know, you need to confess if you if you have uh, believed in the superstition that a man could become a wolf and stuff like that, even going back as far as a thousand years. Um, I would have to say that my personal opinion is that at least some people have accomplished it physically. Um, but like the witch burnings, there were obviously a lot of people that went to the stake and were completely innocent. And there's, there's also different things. I mean, you can look at uh, the, the Beast of Gévaudan, if I'm pronouncing that French word right, and, and it killed over a hundred people. So something was out there and it wasn't an ordinary wolf. It was definitely some sort of a ferocious creature um, that, yeah, you know, and, and I think that um, there were at least some people that did. Now, I um, developed, if you look back in the traditional werewolf lore, it was not um, a matter of someone being bitten by a werewolf. That's just kind of something that Hollywood has taken as, as it's similar to the vampire. Now, uh, even with the vampire, um, most of the, uh, the way that someone became a vampire wasn't necessarily from becoming bitten. There was all kinds of different ways to become a vampire, such as even committing suicide could make you become a vampire, you know. But... Hollywood kind of took that idea of that if you're bitten by another werewolf, you become a werewolf. But that's, I really have found no evidence of that in the ancient lore. And it was a matter of three different processes. And one was a belt that you put on you. Yes. And another one was making a pact with the devil. And then the third component was an ointment. And if we look at this ointment, it's very fascinating because it appears in a lot of different areas. And you've probably heard of witches flying ointment and studied a little bit about that. And there, there was also what they called fairies ointment and lycanthropic ointment. The process of becoming a werewolf was very dependent upon this ointment. Mm. And if you look at what the ointment was composed of, it had um, like, you know, <clears throat> opium and datura and, and henbane and wolfsbane and some of these really strong um, psychedelics that were in your witch's ointment. Mm. And people would go through a process of invoking the devil or the wolf spirit or the lord of the forest, depending on what they called it, and they'd smear this ointment on themselves and put on the wolf skin. Now, the components in that ointment would definitely make you believe that you had become uh, a werewolf we might compare it to tripping on LSD or mushrooms in our modern times, you know? So there were definitely a lot of people that did that. 
And if you look at the, the judges themselves who actually, uh, you know, tried werewolves and, and the werewolf trials, the werewolf trials were a small portion of the witch trials. And, um, you know, that you can read their writings and I've got some of it in my book um, where they actually explain why they condemn these people to death and, and the different aspects of the phenomenon. Some people believe that uh, when people would go into trance, <clears throat> their spirits would possess the body of a wolf, a physical wolf that existed, and they would go around carrying on these different acts. Um, and then some people believe that the devil put a sort of illusionary form over people so that it, it, it tricks their eyes. As they said, the devil tricks the eyes of those who see the werewolf. That was another uh, way of it. But I, I do think um, that there were at least a few people who actually did achieve it. Um, and I, and, Go ahead. I think, sorry, it's just, you know, again, like <clears throat> the subject matter, I, when somebody just listens to this from the outside initially and they haven't done the research and they haven't looked at like this, because there was a point where the church took this very, very seriously. Um, it was a, you know, executable crime, uh, essentially. And um, a lot of people look at these things and they just kind of like brush them off as purity superstition because it's so far outside of, you know, reality for the typical, you know, individual. Yet, there were research cases. I remember there was one just in the area of hypnosis where they took, where they were experimenting with the exper with, with uh, remote hypnosis and certain subjects were taking part of the experiment without knowing when the situation was going to happen. And the hypnotist would then be in a separate place. He would go on the, on the, on the hypnotic journey, place himself in a very deep, profound trance, and then connect and almost remote hypnotize the other individual. The people then watching the other individual would then observe the person kind of get, becoming sleepy, going into trance, and then um, going about and proceeding it. And they followed the one individual and he went down this little journey, this little walk. And halfway through it, he kind of seemed like he came to, and then he was back for a few for a half a minute, and then he went back into the trance. And when they interviewed the hypnotist afterwards, the hypnotist said, you know, there's a point that he put himself so deep that he lost consciousness. And he then kind of emerged. And there is, we know that the brain communicates across distances at a massive kind of level. So indirectly, there's a hypnotic level of influence that's happening between brains that is outside the normal localized or sensory range of data. The effect that that has on consciousness since reality is created inside of the brain brings us to almost like a, a, a tear because we always speak about these levels of manifestation, the mental, spiritual levels down to the astral, you know, down to almost like the psychological and down to the physical being the final one. Um, but I think the, the thing that is often forgotten is that the more the more we go in, the more we go into this path, the more of that energy, we stop directing almost the flow of sexual energy to the world. It's no longer, my validation is no longer met from, you know, what car I drive, what person I'm with, that kind of stuff. It now becomes internally validated and gets now moved into my craft and my magic. So that power, that resource is now more available to make this more real in its manifestations. And we know we've got, there's so much evidence about the mind body relationship. You know, the more we convinced of who we are, or what the world is, we start programming our biology towards that. But then we look at, we're only expressing, I believe two, 3% of our DNA's potential. And the difference between us and a silverback gorilla, is something like 2% of that 3%. So what other potential is literally still dormant inside of our DNA that we're not even coming to the bridge. We're still a, very much, even as magicians that, you know, are literally the outside. If you take the personal development movement and you take the occult movement, the occult movements that that movement on steroids, we're trying to push the boundary of consciousness and reality to a whole new level. And many start to experience the stage where physical reality or the physical body almost gets overwritten for periods of time. I know there's been times where I've worked with certain um, of the goethic spirits where the manifestations was so physical at one point, I thought there's something physically wrong with my brain. I need to go in for a brain scan. And I went in for a brain scan. There was nothing wrong with my brain. Everything was fine. But the effects were physically happening inside of my body to the point where people would look at me and they could see physical changes in my form, in my shape. Energetically, it could be felt. And I think people don't realize how real this can get, how progressive it can get. But that can be scary for some, but it also opens up a range of possibilities that, that 
in, in human potential or in the potential of consciousness that we're just scratching the surface of. And because we have systems like you know, many of the right hand path religions that are so busy indoctrinating us against the possibilities of consciousness. This is not a field that enough people have experimented in, you know, or explored in. What is your view um, on, on that and the boundaries that we may need to let go of, um, of that conditioning in order to help us get to that next stage of our craft and of our magic? Well, I do believe in reincarnation, but I think that not everybody is the same. I mean, some people just don't seem to have that spark of consciousness. I mean, when I look at my brothers and sisters, I was in a family of five, and I'm the only one out of five who has taken up the magical path to Books a Million, our local bookstore, and they've noticed that there's this whole aisle here with all this new age and, and you know witchcraft stuff. Why didn't they ever walk down that aisle and say, Hmm, what is this? You know, let me, let me look at this or what causes one person to say, let me give you a really, what I feel like is a really important example. Okay. Uh, I have um, kept a dream diary at certain points in my life, extremely religiously. One of my books was 500 real dreams, which was where I recorded 500 of my dreams and, and released them. And I was standing in work one day and there was this guy and he was talking to someone else, a, a girl, I was working in a restaurant and uh, the girl said, she said, uh, I was dreaming about blah, blah, blah last night, you know? And the guy said, I, I haven't had a dream in a year. Or he might've said, I only had one dream this year. And at that time, I had had probably over 300 dreams in that year. Because I was keeping my dream diary so religiously, there was a time when I had 26 dreams in one week. There was a time when I had six or maybe even seven dreams in a single night because I was so dedicated to this practice. And I thought to myself, you know, what's the difference between me who's had say 300 dreams this year and this guy who hasn't had but maybe one or two? I mean, scientifically, just, just from a raw scientific, well, you might say, well, because I'm seeking this out, I'm opening up different parts of my brain and I'm able to experience this and other people that never try to open their consciousness or, or carry out magical experiments. They just, uh, the magical world just flies right in front of their face and they never know it's there. Um, or is there something uh, different? You know, what makes a person, they say some people hear the music and some people feel the music. And, and I think that it's the same way with magic, you know, um, some people just are able, I don't know, I mean, I, I, it's not a racial thing. There's magicians of every race and culture. Um, it just seems to be that some people just don't, they don't pick it up. They don't, they don't see it, you know, or, or also I wonder why did Asmodee appear to me and not another person? Uh, is it because I had past life experiences with him and, and something like that. I don't know. I mean, when, when you're dealing with this, we're, we're talking about just the vastness of the world and consciousness and, and you know, uh, life after life and, and, and reincarnation. And we just don't know these answers. Um, but definitely there's something different about me that has caused me to have magical experiences and to seek this stuff out. So... And I suppose all witches, there's something different about them. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's kind of a, a very good place or bus to close today's session, because I think what you, what you kind of, you know, touched on there is, is so, it's so key. There's people that can kind of dabble, you know, there's people that dabble in the craft, they dabble in the practice, you know, they, they want the quick spell, the quick fix. And the truth of the matter is they're not magi. They're not, they're not witches. They're not true occultists. They, they are people which with all fairness and rightness are struggling with an emotional problem or a financial or material problem. And they're looking for a quick way out of it, a quick way out of pain and into pleasure. You know, that's, that's it. Um, and then there are, are those of us that no matter what we do, we cannot walk away from the path. It's just who we are. It's the way we're built, so to speak, whether that's the way we're built at a soul level and we're all bringing little items to contribute to this piece being a witch, you know, I think people always had this mythology that it was, it was in the bloodline or it was in the past lives. It was, you're part of something. 
And maybe it is something that at some point in the past life, all of us got initiated into a certain coven or a certain group where we made contact with a certain spirit or call group. I'm not sure, but it's definitely not, it's not like you're a natural expansion in ter terms of certain fields of research. You're either in this and you're walking this path or you're not. Not everyone can walk it through. Um, who is it? Uh, Curtis Joseph that, that did the, the Black Book of Araman when I had the conversation with him. We saw, he said it also quite nicely. He said, anybody can go to war, but not everyone is built for war. You know, anyone can kind of dabble with a quick you know, spell on it, but not everyone's a witch. And you will kind of know that you're a witch simply because you cannot walk away from this part of your own nature. And I think when people can just learn from uh, one of the things that I hope that we inspire some people to do, people that are maybe listening to this now, is learning to trust yourself and learning to trust that path of your experience and do your own research to pioneer your own work. You know, one of the reasons I respect you is simply because you've had you haven't taken things just from a base level. You went and you took the grimoires. You went further than most people would ever bother looking um, to get to the information. You went and built all the tools, took the steps. You didn't take the shortcuts, so to speak. And you experimented with what worked and what didn't work until you found and developed, you know, quite frankly, a, a system that works for you and is, you know, helped many others. You know, I know everyone that I've spoken to that utilized your system has seen progressive results. And that progressive results does not come from something that's just intellectually based. It is something that comes from a result of experience and practice, you know. So, you know, as we close up our session today, um, I want to thank you, you know, for your contribution to our community, um, to the occult world in general, um, and the research that you're doing, the contribution in your books, and also how involved you are just in the forums and the community, just helping people get, get the information, you know, that is needed to. So just, you know, from me to you, and I think from the entire, you know, listener base, you know, thank you so much, you know, for everything you've done that you continue to do. We look forward to the, you know, the up and coming five books, you know, in the series um, and the pieces of work ahead. Um, but as we close, is there any kind of like a last personal message that you might want to give to listeners um, that are both on this path as in discovering it and are maybe a little bit further on this path and maybe are feeling a bit disenchanted? You know, maybe they're not getting that breakthrough. Maybe they're a little confused on, on where to focus their energy. What would be a message that you would like to share with them as a closing thought? Um, well, I would just say that um, to get success in evocation, you're going to have to have a series of conjurations. That's your words that you conjure. And then you're going to have to have those three keys of the stillness of the mind through meditation and prayer and fasting. And, you know, well, the three keys are um, meditation and celibacy and diet control. Those three keys, if you combine those with the right words, you will experience what you need to experience. And I would say, start with the basics, read the old grimoires as much as you possibly can, and then work your way to the new material if you wanna see spirits. Um, but I would also like to say that thanks to you personally, uh, because I've enjoyed this conversation, it's been fun, and I, I think that uh, I like your vibe, man. You got a good vibe, and I can see in your eyes that you are a magician, you have it, and I'm not pulling your leg. It's hard to get compliments out of me because I take this stuff so serious that it's very few people that I say they got it. You know, I laugh at most practitioners, um, and, and I think you've got it, and I appreciate that, having being able to talk to you and enjoy this conversation, and I'd like to do it again sometime if you'd like. So <clears throat> that's about it for me, man. I, I, I had fun, and, and I appreciate you. Thank you very much. That means a lot. Um, very, it's been an honor um, and an absolute pleasure. Uh, I can, I can definitely also say that, you know, just in our communication, the energy, you know, what I've seen inside of your energy field is also very legit. Um, it's a, it's a walk. It, it was a walk in a park to really just flow our conversation. And I do hope that we get to have more of these conversations because I do believe it's, it's when people like us come together and we share our experience and our knowledge um, in a congruent way. And we, we bring that to the community. I don't know who's listening to this that needs to hear this, but I know someone is getting a benefit from that. And it may just be a door, maybe an energetic thing, or maybe an idea that's 
been released that helps them progress on the path. So, um, you know, in closing this, if you are listening, anyone who is listening, if you found benefit in this, please do message us. I'm going to make sure that all the links that you can get to Arundel's work is inside of the, the video links. Um, and I'll make sure that they're also on the posts. There's a lot of benefits still to come and still to be available. Arundel, thank you so much again for this. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor. And I look forward to having thank you. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. We'll see you later. Have a good night. Perfect. Thank you so much. I've always felt a little different, a little uneasy between regular folk, a bit of a dreamer, a lost cause, a little non-ordinary, some would say. I think I've always just been this way. My mother said I was special. My father thought I should be feared. But I knew that witchcraft coursed through my veins the first time I tasted the lips of the goddess inside the rain. Yes, I'm a witch, it's true. And sure, we are the ones who believe in the beauty of nature, who believe in the things science, absent of art, cannot explain, who instead of religion would have romance. And sure, you may think we have lost our way, when in the world of predictable things we have such unfamiliar things that we would like to say. But maybe, in a world so cold and alone, a little unfamiliar is exactly what is needed to show us the way home. Hey family, it's Adam Knox here. Thanks for supporting this podcast and, you know, these ideas. I really appreciate free thinkers, you know, like yourselves, that are willing to challenge conventional norms and think for themselves and take on new challenges and look at new ideas. And as such, I want to say that if you haven't yet, if you are looking at ways to improve your knowledge over the entire field and you're looking at a you know regular feed of ideas and concepts to keep improving yourself, I'd like to invite you to sign up at The Cult of You. All my teachings and all my ideas are there for only $19 a month. And every month, I bring you a completely new section of some of the most cutting ideas and I'm constantly adding to that. So I'm constantly reviewing and adding more knowledge as I gain them. And you'll see a lot of the interviews and a lot of things that I do extend on some of the subjects that I cover inside of those areas. I do take quite a bit of effort to make sure that the filming is also quite good and to give you not just a demonstration of rituals, but also talk you through the psychology behind them so that you're empowered to do them. And I cover every subject under the sun from science to art to magic to all the different systems out there from the golden dawn to the western of the western traditions to the left hand path traditions we discuss technology and technomancy we discuss sex magic and seduction we discuss so much more from purely the mental aspects to how do you deal with the darkness when it comes up as well as how do you take those things into business and into your romantic life as well as what are the keys to make your magic work as well as to unlock different degrees of spirituality so if you haven't yet please consider signing up at the cult of you and you'll be able to send me a mail and message there and i'll be there to help you you personally through mail correspondence and chat you and guide you through the entire process. And if you make it through the first year of the entire cycle and you graduate the second year of the program, you're able to have direct sessions with myself and some of the members of my temple. And I look forward to helping you, whether you go that route or not. Please keep enjoying these podcasts. Please share them with people that you think they're are, they are gonna find value in them. Like and subscribe to the show. And please send me your messages to info at the cult of you. I would love to hear what are things that are important to you? What are th ideas and concepts that this raised? Maybe this inspired you. Maybe this you know, made sense to you. Maybe this opened up something. I'd love to hear that. Please talk to me and please share with me. Write in the comments and give me your ideas and concepts. If you're watching this on the YouTube channel, if you're not, if you're only watching this on the YouTube channel, please hit on over to Spotify and do subscribe. And if you're listening to this on Spotify, go check us out on YouTube. But please share this, share these ideas and these concepts and let's, let's have a conversation. I'd love to hear from you. That's it for me. I'm Adam Knox. This is the Cult of You. And remember, live deliciously.